Hi guys, Knembon here and welcome to 23rd episode of Fun Farms. 113 just can't stop to surprise, which is nothing surprising because the game changed so much in so many aspects it feels like a completely new game. One of those big changes is general mob spawning rules. It didn't change drastically, but significantly enough that lots of the existing performance oriented farm designs need to be revised and thrown to the garbage, and some of the fundamental design paradigms need to be replaced with new ones. In today's video I will show you how to build the smallest and the same time the most powerful enderman farm which I tweeted about a couple weeks ago and then I will explain three very significant changes in mob spawning mechanics that came with Minecraft 113 sprinkled with a few small farm concepts demos, another enderman farm and a pigman farm. So let's start with a little tutorial for this here farm since most people would be interested how to build this simple yet powerful enderman farm and then I'll follow up with the explanation why this one is so crazy fast and explain what's up with the mob spawning in 113. So after you free the end from the dragon we need to get far away from the island to set up the farm in the void environment. So there are no other places around us where endermen can spawn. This is kind of obvious thing, uh, what's not obvious is that we have to go to the absolute Y0, to the very bottom of the world. So to do that the easiest place lava bucket on the edge of the main island, let it flow to the bottom and then take it out and put a water bucket one block over from it. So that will create a flowing water column that will uh, help us to create a column of cobblestone. Swing down carefully and start to bridge out at Y0, so right where the cobblestone ends. This is absolutely crucial. Using leaves is the safest way to do so, endermen won't be spawning on them and bothering us as they are full blocks so we shouldn't be glitching into the void with them as a bridging material, they are also very easy to obtain. We need to bridge out at least 150 blocks, 200 to be safe in case we decide to build something on the main island in the future, up until we can barely see the shapes of the main island or don't see it at all. And then we need to place a block, that will be our first spawning space. And we have to make sure it's on the very bottom of the world, otherwise the farm won't work that well. Then to get a farm that can deliver the maximum enderman XP we need to add 5 spaces to one side and 5 to the other. And that would actually be it in terms of the spawning spaces, however we can safely add more, in this case I'm adding 3 more rows, so 44 places in total. This won't make us to get more XP, it's just the Enderman will be flowing in faster and in bigger batches, with pretty much at no extra cost. So we don't actually need to use our sword that much with the same effect. Now to make these spawning spots fully effective in terms of the pack spawning, and that's new in 113, we need to surround our spawning platform with leaves, up to 5 blocks out in all directions. In this case these particular blocks are actually quite crucial, but let me finish the tutorial first and explain why later. We can temporarily disable spawning spaces with a few torches so endermen won't be bothering us while we build the rest of it, then we need to go back 18 blocks from our bushy platform to the main island and widen the leaves pass to 3 wide, and at the end we build a little staircase that goes up up to 3 blocks. Now we have to leave two blocks gap and place a top slab four blocks up the ground, place two carpets on top of it, go back one more block, go up like two three blocks and make a small platform to catch the ender bug. Place two rails in the middle and start spamming ender pearls with your named name tag ready. You can make this platform bigger and more safer, especially in survival where endermite will be trying to push himself and you over. Once the endermite is spawned and named, Place a rail and minecart on the block it's in and roll the minecart off the platform until it stops moving. Then remove the platform and let it rest on the carpets below. Just don't try to put it in the minecart first and then rename it, you'll have problems in applying the name tag once the endermite is in the minecart. Now go back to the bottom, place the chest for enderpearls off to the side and then point 6 hoppers into it, that would be our 2x3 killing area. I prefer 2x3 versus something smaller as this is sufficient for sweeping to have a full effect yet prevents mob cramming so we can have a full benefit of slaying entire mob cup of endermen at once. And now it's time to finish the containment area. For the player, place use 6 daylight sensors for the floor and 6 slabs for the ceiling. 
If you are like super poor and don't have daylight sensors, you can use slabs here as well. They're just not going to be that convenient comparing to the daylight sensors. Then you just need to build around the kill zone. You can use some carpeting uh, to contain the endermen and prevent them to teleport around the player. We can then add some extra space for the player. We can use some carpets and strings, which is a simple way of letting players step right just above the void without the risk of endermen teleporting to them. And this concludes the farm. As simple as a mob farm can get, yet powerful as... F so why it works that well? First, let's start with something more obvious, which is safety of the player. In many Enderman farms I have seen where Enderman is not at one hit kill and requires the player to use a sweeping sword, there is no separation between the player and the Enderman, so the player can get hit if they get closer than one block to the angry Enderman. But sweeping effect depends on the distance of the mobs from the player, so you want to be as close as possible, possibly right next to the mob. That's why we have used here daylight sensors and trapdoors, as player eye height is right at the bottom of the trapdoor, meaning that Enderman, if attacked by the player, won't be able to see their eyes, which is required for mob to aggro. This means that we can stay right next to the Enderman and slay them all at once without them even noticing it. The rest of the tricks of the farm have to do with the changes of mob spawning in 113, so that would be the perfect moment to introduce them and talk a little bit about them. The first is a bug fix for a bug that lingers since 1.9 introduced with the introduction of new boats that don't break anymore, and that fix was spotted early by Ilmango, I think? Since entity collision code was used for both mob spawning and jumping into boats, when Moyang reworked the new boats, they messed it all up. So previously mobs could spawn in chides each other, now it's all fixed, mobs properly won't spawn in the place where it's occupied by another proper entity. This fix would lower slightly the efficiency of mob farms of all sorts, uh, but in practice its effect is not that noticeable, probably under 10% difference or even less. It does messes with some of the farm designs that relied on spawning inside other entities, but there's not that many of them. Where this fix does help is for example with storing your precious villagers in one by one spots, so no matter what conditions are these spots, zombies won't be able to spawn with the villagers, so I'm guessing that's a plus. The second and much more important change has to do with how high the spawning algorithm is checking for places to spawn, and uh, that change was spotted by Equinox in the Sacraf Discord and was tracked back by Earth Computer to 1.13 pre-release 9, so just before the final release. Unfortunately, the last time I looked at the spawning code was in pre-8 when I was working on the kelp farm, so I didn't keep track of this since then, but so I'm glad Equinox has found that change. And this is a big one, a significant buff to the mob spawning algorithm and the ways it can be used to boost mob farming. So, in general how mob spawning works, assuming mob caps are not full, the game runs spawning algorithm once in each chunk around all the non-spectating players. For that it chooses a random base point in each chunk from where all the spawning starts. While the X and Z coordinates are chosen fully at random, there is not much we can do with those. The choice of Y value depends on the blocks in the chunks, which we can manipulate. In the olden days, till 1.7, the maximum considered Y value was dependent on the LC value, or the last subchunk that had a block in it. So if you place a block, any block really, the spawning was thinned out up to that subchunk for the entire chunk, just because of that one block. And that's what Wiki was saying about mob spawning for the longest time. I haven't checked recently, but I wouldn't be surprised if it still says this way. Spawning in air blocks is very expensive and taxing on the game, so in 1.8 Moyang employed a much more efficient strategy by including the topmost subchunk for each X and Z position independently using chunk height map. Since that structure is ignoring transparent blocks, not only we could manipulate spawning conditions on per block basis and not worrying about the single block somewhere messing up with the spawning in the entire chunk, but now daylight transparent blocks are not affecting spawning or even causing spawning to happen. So like in this case on Sycraft Passive Mob Farm, we can have this AFK balloon overlooking the entire farm and not affecting the spawns whatsoever. Because it was all made out of transparent blocks like hoppers, trapdoors and cauldrons. Yeah, makes sense. In 1.13 it changes again, and now spawning is not depending on any chunk position, neither horizontal nor vertical, it depends only on the topmost block that sees Skylat in each X and Z column. So still, the lower we build the farm, the better the spawning chances are, that didn't change, but now the Y selection and its dependency on the density of spawns is much smoother. So if you plot the chances for a particular Y value to be selected for spawning, in 1.12 as long as the X and Z column in question ended 
up below Y14, this chance was 1 over 16, so 6.25%. And it was decreasing in steps with increasing Y, so above Y30 was half of that, so 3%, above Y46 was about 2%, etc. Every time we were jumping over the subchunk link, we were adding 16 more new Y values for spawning. In 113 subchunks are no more, and that chance only depends on the block above the highest non-daylight transparent blocks. So at those transition points we had previously, chances are the same, but in between we got much higher chances right now, especially if we go really low with the first subchunk. If we have a block at Y0, the chances for spawning at its Y value are now 50%, not 6, so 8 times the spawning chance. And for example, if we place a block at Y1, that's 33% since we have now three Y values for mobs to spawn. Still a huge difference, especially if we go really, really low. That's why our Enderman farm uh, was that effective with a few spawning spaces. Actually, to get a full speed maxed out 60,000 XP design, you'd only need about 10, 12 spawning spaces, which is just crazy. But by quadrupling the minimum required number of spawning spaces without sacrificing the mob collection time a lot, we have a design that brings back the full mob cap of mobs very quickly. So this here simple farm can actually be operated by a few players at the same time, so that when one player kills his own group of let's say 60-80 endermen, they got about 20-25 seconds to ingest all that XP flying around them. And then the other player can use this farm and slay their group of endermen right in between, since it takes about 10 seconds now to fill up the chamber back again. But the new spawning rule is a little bit trickier to work with than it seems at first. Let's look for example at the slope here. Previously, to get mobs to spawn at this spot, right here above this block, for example, the algorithms could start spawning pretty much anywhere here around, since all of it was in the same sub -chunk. And we could have any of these spawns to end up at our spot. With the new system, unless you have blocks at the same level or higher around that spot, there won't be any spawn attempts happening from this side of the slope that can end up on our location, making spawns rarer to happen because they will be cancelled on this side by solid blocks and just not possible on the other one. This means that the flat areas like here will be getting much more spawns than the slopes. What does it mean for our enderman farm or mob farms in general? If you have a solitary spawning space like this one here at Void at Y0, we have the best spawning chances uh, and our only spawning space here right above this block can be chosen at this location at 50% chance. But all around here, since there are no blocks, spawns can only happen at Y0. Obviously nothing is gonna spawn at Y0 because spawns require a solid surface below, but spawning procedures still bring performance Y0 regardless. A great optimization, especially in void environments like here at the end, would be to skip these spawns, but I guess that's Moyang's job to realize it. But seriously, that would help a lot reducing spawning lags if you're flying over ender voids. But this also means that a spawn on our solitary space would only be successful if it originated exactly from that spot, which is rather unlikely. And what we want to do is increase spawning around our target spot with blocks that block daylight, at least to the same level as our spawning space in question, using some non-spawnable blocks like water or leaves. This will allow the game to originate spawning procedure a little outside of our spot and move it to our block. This wasn't a problem in 112 and below, as spawning in the entire lowest subchunk was always guaranteed. To demonstrate how important it is, we have here two solitary spawning spaces at Y0, one surrounded with glass, which doesn't increase spawning Y value around that spot, and the other one with leaves, which are not spawnable but do block daylight, so they level the max spawning height with our target block. And here we have a little command block that would be removing spawned endermen away so we can get the new ones to spawn. So if you run it for a while, we can quite clearly see that the spots run with leaves get much more love from the Enderman comparing the spots run by glass or if you would surround it by air, for example. So that's why I have surrounded the spawning spaces here with leaves to increase and concentrate spawns on the platform. The good question is, is it beneficial to use leaves if we could simply have more spawning spaces if we would use normal blocks instead? In this case, yes, but not always more spawning spaces means a faster farm. Yet in all cases, more chances for spawning in our target spawning spaces, it always means a faster farm. The last change of spawning has to do with the pack sizes of mobs to spawn. 
Pack spawning is determined by the minimum pack size, the maximum pack size and the maximum mob spawned in a chunk, which determines when the spawning attempts stop in a particular chunk. It's all unnecessarily too complicated, especially the maximum spawned mobs per chunk, but in a gist, the game tries to spawn 3 packs of mobs of sizes, from minimum to maximum, which could be all terminated if we already have maximum mobs per chunk for a given type spawned already in that round. It's a little confusing, but I'll show in a small example how this works first. So let's assume we have mob A and mob B. Mob A spawns in packs from 1 to 4, and mob B spawns always in packs of 4. The maximum spawns per chunk for both mobs, let's say it's 4. So if we draw a first pack of mob A, we can for example get a pack of size 3, and we may end up, let's say, with those 3 spawns. So since we are spawning up to 3 packs, the next pack, for, let's say, we will draw the mob B, so a pack of 4 mobs, but right after the first spawn, the spawning will stop because the total number of mobs in that round is already 4, which is the maximum for mob B, and that also means that the third pack won't spawn as well. So the pack sizes are important, but larger pack sizes don't mean automatically lots more spawns, because it's all is bounded by the total number of mobs spawned in one round, which is typically 4. So back in 1.8, all packs have always been 4 spawn attempts in any pack of any mob, and the maximum number of mobs per chunk was mostly 4, with a few exceptions like gas had 1, so 1 gas would prevent the rest of the spawn attempts in that chunk, horse had 6, and wolf had 8. I don't know exactly why, maybe they wanted a 4 pack of wolves to attempt to spawn something else, like a 4 pack of sheep, for the added fun. I don't know, but with gas it kinda makes sense, one gas is enough fun for a chunk already, yet still it would attempt a pack of 4 in the first place. In 1.9 all of it stayed the same, except now packs were variable size from 1 to 4, and my guess is that the compact update was too much to handle 4 creepers every single time, but this change lowered also in noticeable manner output of all the farms, especially those that uh, either run way below the mob cap like witch farms, or those that have heavily optimized for a proper use of the mob cap, but that's still 1.12. In 1.13, that's my guess, when developers realized that the mob specific pack sizes that they have diligently put in the code way before are not being used for natural mob spawning, so the dream of having large flocks of fish didn't work because all they were getting was 2.5 fish at a time, like any other mob. So they put new limits for pack sizes back into the spawning. So since there's plenty of mobs, now with very specific pack sizes, I'll briefly go through some most important groups. So regular overworld hostile mobs now spawn back in packs of fours like creepers, skeletons, spiders, so that decrease associated with 1.9 changes is pretty much reverted. I calculated back then to have a 10 to 30% impact on the output of the farms depending on the specific layout of spawning spaces, and that's now essentially reverted with all the groups spawning now four mobs exactly. There are a few notable exceptions, which is spawn only in singles, so it will be now pretty impossible to spot even a pair of witches out in the wild. But what is more important, witch farms gonna provide much less, about 40% less than previously. Drowned are ones as well, ex as well as zombie villagers. A little known fact, zombie villagers are 5 times more likely to spawn in large spruce tigers, who knew? And a lot less wildcats in the jungles. So, an increase to spawning for all sorts of mobs, regular mob farms, slime farms, pigment golem farms, uh, and a little debuff to witch farms. Slight increase to guardian farms, a little less endermen comparing to other mobs. In terms of the passive mob farms, most old school ones are back to 1.8, 404, which some exceptions in donkeys, much less of them, they spawn in plains and savannas, but only single ones in savannas. Horses spawn in groups 2 to 6, but with increased maximum spawn in chunk limits, so that's a thing, still 5 times less likely to spawn in savannas. Llamas are 4 to 6, with limits of 6 per chunk, that's much more llama. Mushrooms are 4 to 8, yet still limited to max 4 mobs per chunk, so much easier to spawn a full pack, even in more trickier conditions. Parrots is much less, and even less so in hilly jungles. And turtles. A buff from Zilch, I guess, now an exclusive passive spawn to spawn on beach biomes and to spawn on sand, not grass. Yay, I'll need to carpet all the beaches now around the passive mob farms or just replace it with concrete powder. So in general, passive mob farms are all the same, except but with more llamas. 
The special mention requires to be given uh, to the Nether Fortress mobs. Not only they form their own ecosystem, but they change a lot since 112. All mobs got some buff, especially Skellies and Wither Skellies, less so the Blazes, so all Nether Fortress farms should now be spawning more Wither Skeletons. To see that I prepared a small demonstration of this, uh, we are here in the Fortress area in the Nether, and now let the game spawn a bunch of packs, and now we can go and observe them. So as you can see, most skeleton groups are now using the full 4 limits per chunk spawn, filling the space with them and preventing blazes from spawning. So if you look at some blaze packs, now they spawn from 2 to 3 in a pack, so they'll be more likely assisted with a 3rd or 4th creature of some sort to fill up the limit to 4. So yeah, changes to fortress base farms, and you should be getting a lot more schools for those who use beacons as light sources. Quick note on bats, yes, it's like they weren't annoying enough before. Great news for bat farmers though. And at the end, war mobs, as I said, likely the whole source of this entire spawning of Fefe, with huge flocks of tropical fish and small groups of dolphins and pufferfish. Squids, a little bit larger packs in warm oceans, but still with vastly different composition of the weights of these mobs from biome to biome, so it's hard to say. So, that's all for the spawning changes. And this explains the new design for the Enderman farm. Just a few spawning spaces right at Y0 to get the sweet 50% chance of successful selection for our spawning platform in question. And it's even jab safe, so you can even use dirt blocks for the spawning pads. They won't steal them. It's all surrounded with leaves to bring more pack spawns attempts from around the farm, because now sub chunks are no more, and you have to take care of every single spawning layer separately. A little fence here so these morons don't just go straight down to the void, but at least they pathfind some. Then a three wide path, which I prefer instead of having a railing. It looks simpler yet functions the same way. It's even better because it doesn't limit the flow of endermen to a single file, and now they can pile up if they really want to do so. When building it, just to make sure that all the endermen in all position can see endermites from all the points in the path. If they teleport back to any of the spots for whatever reason, they might get stuck here without seeing the target. If that happens, just nudge the minecart a little to make sure it's visible for all the endermen. By the way, the endermen takes an average 30 ticks or 1.5 seconds to locate and run towards the enderbug with a Poisson distribution. I mean, they don't run with that distribution, they just it just may take them a lot of time to get there. And at the end, our patented 2x3 collection chamber with a safe player access with a daylight sensor, a slab and a trap door so Enderman won't retaliate. That could be it, but I have two more farms to show you. And first is right here. It's a revised Enderman farm from the very beginning of the series. In episode 1, which was the second episode of the series, I have shown a cool but not that effective farm based on Enderman teleportation ability, and this is revised and greatly simplified version. Previously we didn't have sweeping, so all the Enderman needed to be brought to one heart, and I didn't know a thing about mob spawning. Now with super fast spawning at the bottom of the world and sweeping edge, it means that we don't need to worry about bringing them to one heart, and this concept actually makes for a decent working farm. It's not max 60,000 XP per hour, but probably more like decent 40k, so not that far off, yet much more fun, which is why you play this game. Here I use 69 spawning spaces, so almost enough spaces for a full mob cap. Remember now mobs need their own personal space to spawn so they won't share. Once they spawn, which is a pretty much instant, they get bombarded by snow golems around, which cause them to attempt to teleport. The farthest spots of the killing platforms and spawning pad are at most 32 blocks away in a cubicle fashion, so that's the limit of Enderman teleport. So the only valid teleport locations for them are 9 spots on the killing chamber as well as 70 spots on this spawning platform. However, I am here inhibiting most of their teleport location at the spawning pad with these trapdoors and carpet layers, yet still allowing the spawns to concentrate around the bottom of the world because trapdoors and tra carpets are daylight transparent. The teleport locations in the center here have a free access to the sky and this means that the teleportation has a greater chances of success at these locations. Uh, also don't use single carpets here for the collection as they would still inhibit most teleportations. Use trapdoors or slabs or uh, plain hoppers instead. This entire area is all spawn and teleport proof for all the endermen. Here I use carpets on strings. 
It's the same thing what I used to place and contain the snowman up here. Speaking of up here, the water here is not only to prevent Enderman from teleporting, but also increases the Y value around the spawning paths. And once the random Enderman gets pushed into water, it still will be attempting to teleport out of it right into our player location. In terms of the player space, I again use daylight sensors as a flooring, but in this case I use Endros to support the ceiling. Endros is yet another weird block that Enderman won't teleport onto, but still need a single carpet on top of them because Endros themselves don't prevent from teleporting 100% as Enderman still has a very low yet non-zero chance of teleporting into that narrow spaces in between the Endros. But if you want you can just use slabs and double carpets on top of them as well. So this might not be the most powerful Enderman farm, but it's a really cool one and a really quiet one <laughs> comparing to the other ones. So it might be a good addition, for example, as part of a base with Enderman magically teleporting to the middle of the room. So that would be it in terms of the farm. If you need more details on the Enderman teleportation mechanics, I recommend you guys check out that ancient episode of mine. Stuff didn't change that much since then, except now this type of farm is much easier to build. For the last bit I would like to guys have a look at this concept zombie pigment farm. It only has about 150 spawning spaces but requires some bedrock removal. I know that bedrock removal is not that easy and straightforward to do in 1.13 as those in 1.12 but I know that many especially technical players are still waiting in 1.12 for the version that doesn't lag that much and are still be able to break bedrock using some other methods like dragon eggs. Since the bottommost layer is not breakable using egg method I place here the spawning platform not at Y zero but at Y1 so it's not that painful to do at all. Obviously you need to remove portions of the ceiling as well for it to work. We have here a couple of iron golems attracting magma slimes and a few named pigmen 36 blocks away from the player to keep the aggro chain going strong and continuous. And here at the front we have a few stacks of minecarts to kill pigmen with crummy. This setup here with 150 spawning spaces produces about 100,000 XP per hour, so not the maximum pigment amount, but it's not bad either. And that's arguably lots of work to clear up all that bedrock and prepare all this perimeter around. So it's probably cheaper and easier to build a traditional donut farm up in the sky, but definitely a fun concept and a good option if you already have another fortress perimeter for example, and you want to add a quick and simple AFK pigment XP farm. So that would be all guys for today, three major changes to mob spawning in 113 and a general buff in spawning for most mob classes and a definite buff for very low level farms with the simplest and probably one of the most powerful enderman farm you can build. As well as a couple of other simple and quirky concept farms. 113 still doesn't fail to surprise us with the new stuff and changes to the gold old mechanics so no one knows what we'll be able to find next. Unfortunately I was away a couple weeks ago when Equinox shared these findings and I was unable to make a video explaining all of it changes earlier, but in this case I discussed it on Twitter, so that would be a good place to keep track of some of my ideas in case I cannot make a video for example. Anyways that's it guys for today, I hope you enjoyed the video and learned something, all the small little bits and quirks that makes this farm here so powerful and so simple at the same time. So don't forget to leave me a like, leave me a comment in the comment section below, remember to subscribe if you haven't done it already for more such content in the future and see you in the next one, bye bye!